Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Cool. Actually, now we are going to be doing commissioning our youth into their schools and their sports and their jobs. So actually, can I have the youth all come up in the front right here? Awesome. Yeah. And then I'll have my leaders, come, my adult leaders come up as well. Um, and then, yeah, I'll have you guys line up right here, come in the middle, or scoot down. Um, but yeah, so we're just actually, we're going to pray over them as they um, go back into school, like I said this week, as they um, go into their schools. These are their schools right here, um, a lot of their sports, and then here are some of the jobs that they're even working at. Um, so we wanted to really commission them out into, um, yeah, all, all these things when, when it seems like this, the summer's over and they're going back to normal life, so we want to kind of commission them out. And I actually have, I had a word for them, too, and I wanted to pray this over them, but I felt like the, the schools and the sports and the jobs kind of were filled with water, and they were like these little, like, fires going out, and the thing, usually fire goes out when there's water, right? But the thing that was keeping them lit was God's oil, and God's oil was just kind of keeping the fire lit. And so you guys, as you guys go out, don't, like, be courageous and, like, go out into these places that may be filled with water and maybe trying to put your flame out, but the Lord wants to keep lighting your fire. So if I could, yes, if I could have actually everyone stand up and then um, people that are closely connected to um, these kids, will you come and lay hands on them, like families, family members, um, and we're just going to pray over them. But yeah. Okay. Yes, Jesus. Um, God, we just thank you so much for our youth, Jesus. We thank you so much for, for what you've taught us this summer um, and, and everything from, from summer camp to, to nights at the beach, Jesus. And I just pray that they would be bold and courageous to go out into these places, Jesus, that, that want to, to diminish and their fire, Jesus, want to diminish their, um, their belief in you, Jesus. So I just pray that, that they would um, stay strong in you and they would know um, what they have in you is real, Jesus, and they would bring it to people, God. I just pray um, against any anxiety, depression, Jesus, that they would be a light to the people that are having these issues, God, that, they, that people would look at them and say, what's different about them? That they, they would say, something's different and I want to know more. So, Jesus, I just pray again for boldness and courage as they go out, that they would pray for people, that they would speak life in places of death. Um, yeah, and just pray a, a protection covering over them as well, God. Yeah, in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much. Aren't you guys proud of our youth? Can we give them another hand, you guys? So, so awesome. I just, how awesome would it have been if when you were their age, you knew you were on mission, right? How, how incredible would that have been? I, instead of just being so insecure about fitting in and and just trying to, you know, not make waves or wanting everybody to like you, but you actually knew, no, this is my mission field? Well, guess what? It is. It's still your mission field. Just as much as they understand they're going with a co-mission, God's asking, wants to do something with them to reach their generation. It's the same with us. There's never been a time when you and I need to be able to hear God's voice speaking to us so he can speak through us to the world around us. It's now. And that's what this whole series is about, hearing God is about understanding that God wants to speak to us so he can speak through us because there's a world that needs to know that he's real, that he's alive, that he's with us. Just as much as we just commissioned our youth, I'm hoping you'll feel that same understanding here today before you go, that God would know that you are called and purposed for his, for his purposes. And I, I, how many of you guys have just spent way too much money on, on school supplies? Like, I, I can't believe how much money it costs just to give our young people the thing they need to be able to continue to grow and, and to be able to go. And though they're not excited about going back to school, we want to make sure that they have everything they need. But how ridiculous would it be if they showed up with their backpacks full of, of you know, texts and uh, pencils and pens and calculators and all of those resources, and then they put them firmly in their backpack and then never got it again? I think we could all predict how their uh, grades would be at the end of that semester. They would have a big fat F, or they don't give Fs anymore because it's too wounding of their egos. I, I don't know what it is that they give, give now, but anyways, it, it would not be good. It would not be good. They wouldn't pass. 
Well, now, we, we can do that basic arithmetic. If you don't use the resources that you're given, you're, you're going to fail the class that you're taking. Well, how come we can't do that same arithmetic when it comes to our spiritual lives? If we don't use the resources that we we have to understand that it's not going to go well for the spiritual life that we've been called to live. Every one of us have been given an amazing gift in the Word of God, and yet so many of us have them just kind of locked up. The Bible is the most valuable thing that the world has been given. The very foundation of our Western culture, our own country, has been stated on the principles and founded on the principles of the Word of God. It's the primary medium by which God speaks to his people is the Word of God. And yet increasingly it's disrespected by most of society. And this thing keeps uh, dropping out, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll try this one. Hello. Not that you need this to hear my voice, um, but we are talking about hearing God's voice through his word, and yet we, we have the word of God already written down for us, and it's never been more accessible than it is right now, and yet most of us are not paying any attention to it. We're the kid locking up the resources in the locker and wondering why we're failing at this uh, course called Life. John Wycliffe, six centuries ago, translated the word of God to, um, out of the original languages into a common language so the people that wanted to read the word of God for themselves could, and he was burned alive at the stake for doing so because the religious leaders of his day wanted to keep the power. If they had the word of God, they had the power. And John Wycliffe and a number of others were saying, no, it's actually the priesthood of the saints. Everyone should have access to the word of God. He died to make sure they could have the scripture in their hands and the language that they could understand. Fast forward to today. 2023, the YouVersion app on our, on our phones offers 2,062 versions of the Bible, 1,372 languages, all completely free. John Wycliffe died to make sure we had Scripture. We didn't even have to pay to download all these versions of Scripture, and yet research shows that 78% of Americans own a physical copy of the Bible, but only 9% read it. Ouch. Now, today's goal is not to be, you know, a drive-by guilty. And I understand that if I, if I asked any of you guys, hey, do you think you should spend more time of your word, in your word, most of us would be, including myself, like, yes, I definitely need to spend more time in this. And yet, as Gallup says, we revere the Bible, but we don't read it. It is the best-selling, least-read book in America. I wonder if that's why America looks the way that it does right now. I wonder if that's why the church looks the way that it does right now. Because God's primary means of speaking to us is through his word, and if most of us have it but we aren't reading it, no wonder we're not hearing God's voice. So just like our students are going back to school on mission to learn and hear God's voice on behalf of their generation, I'm praying that you and I would as well, that we would put our learner caps on and that we would lean into the scripture as we started last week, this couple, this married couple, Cleopas and Mary, after the, uh, the death of Jesus, they think Jesus is still dead. If you didn't catch last week's message, you can catch it on our YouTube channel. But the, the setup is this. They're on their way from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus. It's a two-hour journey. And Jesus, without revealing himself and who he is, he sidles up alongside next to them. And he begins to enter a conversation with them. And they tell him about how sad and depressed and despondent they are that Jesus, is, Jesus died. And with them, all their hopes and their dreams and before Jesus shows up and goes, hey, it's me, he begins to unfold two-hour-long Bible study of how from the beginning to the end, all of Scripture was about him. This is amazing to me. Look at this. You can follow along in your notes. we got paper notes on these tables here or on your, uh, your Father's House app. But it says here at the top of your notes in Luke 24, verse 22, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is amazing to me. I want you to understand the sequence of how God reveals himself to this couple is often how he will reveal himself to us. 
Notice that he doesn't show up and say, hey, I am Jesus. I'm the one that you guys think is dead. I'm alive. Here I am. Hello. He didn't do that. In fact, he doesn't even show himself personally or prophetically until the end of that two-hour journey, which means he reached their head before he reached their heart. This is important for us because, especially if, like me, you've grown up in Pentecostal charismatic circles, uh, moving with the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, that's absolutely what God is, has allowed for us to do. But a lot of times growing up, it felt like I was supposed to check my, my head at the door in order to follow my heart and to follow the Holy Spirit. And yet what we see Jesus here is he's revealing himself first through Scripture, through a, a systematic theological unpacking of how this entire story was God's story plus their story equaling history. I wonder if you've ever thought about the Bible that way. God's story impacting your story is what's making history. Have you ever approached the scripture the way Jesus was asking his people to do? Because I'm wondering if you and I did if we would never go a single day without picking this up and going, Jesus, how are you going to reveal yourself to me today? In fact, speaking of that, there was a, a survey done recently by Scott Lindsay from Logos Bible Software working for the Center for Bible Engagement. And they polled 400,000 people from the ages of 8 to 80. And they, came, they were asking them how they engage with Scripture and they made a profound discovery along the way. That if you engage with the scripture uh, once a week, let's say this is your only time. Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're hearing the word. But even with these amazing sermons that happen every single week, that this is where you guys go, amen, hallelujah. Yeah, so, wow, you guys, you know what? Thank you for keeping me humble. I really appreciate that. Even with amazing sermons, it's not going to change a lot. I mean, that's what this survey said. Even if this is your only engagement with Scripture, it's not going to change two, three times. Similar. It's good that you're in it, but not going to change a lot. But on four times, four times of engagement with Scripture, it's off the charts how your internal transformation affects your outward behavior. Look at these stats here. Now, your negative behavior is affected. Feeling lonely. Any of you guys ever felt lonely? Can I just suggest to you? Get into the word at least four times a week, and it's going to drop 40%. Anger issues, come on, guys. Yeah, we deal with anger a lot of times. It's going to drop 32% if you're in the scripture at least four times a week. Bitterness and relationships, you know who you are. Get into the word of God. Let him speak to you. Drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Gambling drops 74%. This is, this is mind-blowing. We knew theologically that we're supposed to read God's Word. We know that it is living and active and sharper than two, any two-edged sword, able to divide Word from Spirit. We know there's no book on the planet that was written by God that can transform us from the inside out. But this is empirical data showing us why God is saying, I want to speak to you through my Word on a daily basis. On the positive side, look how it changes our behavior. Sharing your faith jumps 200%. Well, that makes sense. If you're going to be spending time at the feet of Jesus and you're going to be changed by him, you're going to want everybody that you know to know about him. Of course we're going to share. Not because we have to, because we want to. Discipling others jumps 230%. We talked about this two weeks ago. You, we can't share what we haven't first received. We can't make disciples if we aren't already being discipled, and then 407% memorizing scripture. I mean, every kid knows if they're going to pass the test, there's going to have to be some facts that, and things they're going to have to memorize for the test. You, and in order to do that, they actually have to read the book. Right? It's the same with us. If you, you're going to have a hard time memorizing the word of God, hiding God's word in your heart so you don't sin against him if you're not memorizing it. This is transformational. And again, my goal up here isn't, God doesn't need a PR agent. My goal here isn't to talk you into reading the word of God. I'm simply presenting the facts. And just like that couple on the road to Emmaus, you and I have to decide, are we willing to lean in and learn from the Savior to rediscover who he is through his word? Or are we just going to be satisfied with what it is we already know about him? I know enough of the word. I've grown up in church. I don't need to spend all of that time studying scripture. But if we could look at it as God's story plus our story, making history. 
It's this beautiful invitation to a daily conversation with the creator of the universe. It becomes not an obligation, but an invitation. And listen, let's just be super honest here. There's times when I wake up and I don't want to spend time in God's word. There's other things that I would rather do. Are you allowed to feel that way? You're a pastor. You're a professional. How dare you feel that? Hey, listen, I'm as human as the next person. I get just as distracted as anybody else. And what, what causes me to stay with this is that sometimes it's a discipline that turns into a delight. You can't expect that every time you sit down with God's word and open up your journal, you're always going to just get something absolutely revelational. But you do have to understand that line upon line, precept upon precept, God's word is changing you. You might not see the change now, but you will over the long term. And this is for the long term. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon, and God's given us the way to be able to win the race, and you and I have to decide, are we willing to learn from him? And I know, I know, I know you've, if you've grown up in church, you've heard this example a million times, and I'll just be honest, I've, I did this myself. When you're really needing to hear a word from God, you just do the Columbus method, right, or the, or the fortune cookie method. Like, I'm just going to open it up, and the Lord is going to lead me to some revelation and answer my big questions, right? What it is that I'm saying. So, like, you know, when I was at Life Bible College, oh, Lord, Lord God, there's this beautiful woman named Cindy. She really loves you. I'm not sure if she loves me, but she really loves you. I'm thinking that she might love me, but I'm not really sure. I think she might be the one, God, but I need your direction. Lord, Lord God, would you direct me? Okay, I'm just going to open up the Bible. I'm not going to look. And wherever I, I put my finger, that's going to be it. Okay, what do we, what do we got here? Uh, Judas went away and hanged himself. No, 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 no. That's, that's uh, uh, two out of three, God. Can we do, can we do two out of three? Well, let, let's go over this again. God, I just, I, I want to know if she's the one. Can you, uh, can you direct me? Here we go. Go forth and do likewise. No, 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 that's, that's not the answer, God. Please, please. And, and, and you and I are desperate to hear God's voice, and we're making a, a game out of it, like a fortune cookie or like a Harry Potter wand that as long as you wave it in the right way with the right incantation, you're going to know God's will. His will's already written down. And if you and I actually read the Scripture correctly with the head and the heart, then we could actually go back to those two passages I referenced and actually get some direction out of it. For instance, the passage about Judas out of Matthew 27, 5. Here's a man laden with guilt and shame, betrayal and tragedy. God might have wanted to use that story to speak to my heart and say, John, if you get so focused on a person as the answer to all of your happiness, you could wind up in the same situation as Judas. Well, what about that second passage, Luke 10, 37, go and do likewise? That's at the end of the Good Samaritan parable where Jesus is talking to them about laying their lives down on behalf of someone else. God could have spoken to my heart and said, John, this isn't about you. Don't be so focused on yourself. Start looking at how you can serve others around you. See, a lot of times we're trying to get God to say something that we want to hear. When what God is saying is already very clear if we'll just read the scripture in context instead of trying to rip pieces and bits out of it to make it fit our scenario. And so I, I, in, in light of that, I just want to teach you two Greek words. You know, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time on this, but we're putting our learner's cap on. And so I want to teach you two Greek words that will help you when you're studying scripture so you're not treating, treating it like a fortune cookie. And the first is exegesis. It's the Greek meaning of this word is to lead or to guide out. We always call the word of God our map, right? Our map for life. And God literally wants to guide us. But if we're reading it in the historical grammatical interpretation, what it originally meant to its original hearers, then we're going to be applying it accurately to our lives. The problem is that a lot of us use eisegesis, which is reading into the word of God from our 21st century context. We're trying to apply what we think is true now and make the word of God say that. It's, it's, it's why we've ended up in so many 
wacky, off-the-wall theology. That's why, maybe you're not aware of this, but a, a number of denominations that have been around for years are splitting in half because some are trying eisegesis, reading into the scripture according to modern-day sensibilities, and others are saying, no, exegesis says this is what it meant to the original hearers. We can't twist it to mean something else, even if it's offensive to 21st century context. And so you and I have to decide, even in our devotional times, how are we going to read it? Exegesis, what, what did it originally mean in its context? Or eisegesis, what I want it to mean so that it makes me feel good about myself. And I'm telling God what he means instead of actually going and saying, God, what did you mean by this situation? And an example of that is, is um, if you go to the passages where Paul is talking about women wearing their head coverings. This could be highly offensive to a 21st century context. Don't worry, women, if you're not wearing head coverings, you're more than welcome here. But what's interesting is if you read that passage, those passages in the Middle East where women still wear head coverings, it makes absolute sense to them because it's, a, it's an effort to honor God in the place of worship. You see, in that context... Paul would have understood that as these women are getting saved out of, out of leading worship in temples as temple prostitutes, they're so free and so excited to no longer be under these lies that they're ripping their, their, their headdresses off, they're ripping their head coverings off because now they're free in Christ. And Paul's whole point is, yes, your freedom is good, but it doesn't mean that you now have to be offensive to the culture around you. The transformation is on the inside. So when he's talking about makeup and jewelry and all of that, it absolutely made sense to the original uh, culture, but to our culture, we're reading that like, what, I have to wear like uh, a hat? I have to, you know, cover my face? No, what's, what would be the application for us? If we know the original historical grammatical interpretation, the application for you and I in our 21st century context is when I gather with the saints or even when I'm out into the world, the point isn't to get people to look at me. The point is to point people to Christ. So by my modesty, by my charity, by my humility, I'm going to be pointing people to the Lord. You see that? Uh, instead of reading into it our 21st century context, we say, what did this mean to the original hearers? Which brings in the second word. The Greek word is hermeneutics, which I always thought was a really funny word. And it's a Greek meaning to translate or interpret. Some of you guys wear glasses. These are the lenses through which you view Scripture. And all of us do. Let's just all admit it. We all sit down. We read scripture according to our own circumstances, sometimes according to our own wounding, sometimes according to our own traditions. And what my prayer is for you, as, as I've been learning to do this myself, is that when you and I sit down with scripture, we would take every lens off except for the lens of love. Because this is what Jesus was doing when he was unpacking scripture to this couple on the road to Emmaus, he said, I'm going to show you all of Scripture from beginning to end was all about Jesus. And that is the Christological hermeneutic, reading Scripture through the lens of God's love. What if you and I, and you're going to love this, if you will actually take me up on this challenge, you're going to love this opportunity to be able to see all of Scripture is Jesus revealing himself to you in the same way he was doing with that couple on the road to Emmaus. This is where the devotional comes in. It's the head and the heart. It's both. He wants to reveal himself through you, through the word. And the reason why, and I know you guys are like, oh, he's here talking about the life journal again. Listen, this is an amazing tool. It's so simple. And if you don't have one, we've got them free for you right out there at the Connect counter. Because it has you reading through the Old and the New Testament. And it has you asking the question, Lord, how do you want to reveal yourself to me today? But the advantage of this versus the fortune cookie method is that it's in context. If you're reading it every day, even though you're journaling on one verse, you're reading it out of its context. What was that whole letter about? What was that whole situation going on with Israel about? One verse might jump out at you, but you're interpreting it in its proper exegesis and hermeneutic. You add on to that, Jesus, how you're revealing yourself to me, and now you're going from the head to the heart. By the time you're done journaling through that passage, you now have a better understanding and hopefully a better uh, look at how Jesus feels about you and what it is he's calling you to do. At the bottom of every page, it says, how will I be different today because of what I've just read? Isn't that amazing? Like we're not just giving intellectual assent to the word of God, but we're actually asking that God would speak to us through his word. 
This is an opportunity to sit down at the table with Jesus every single day. And it is about relationship, not just intellectual assent, because the truth is you and I have known a lot of people that know the word really well, but I'm not really sure they know Jesus. In fact, Jesus says this right here. In, uh, in John 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. This is amazing. We're going to have a whole bunch of people really surprised at the end of their life that they're not getting into heaven. And Jesus is going to look at them and go, I don't know you. And they could quote chapter and verse. No one knew the Torah better, the Old Testament, better than the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And yet they missed the Savior standing right in front of him. Could it be possible? Because you and I are not looking through the lens of the love of God. We're not reading his scripture to know him more. Could it be possible that we know the word, but we don't know the God of the word? That we don't actually have a relationship with him? My goodness, you guys, this is just simply an invitation back to rediscovering who he is through his word. And this is a pretty audacious claim. Jesus is saying, this entire story is my story. I mean, either he is the most narcissistic person to ever walk the planet, or he actually is the Lord of the universe. C.S. Lewis put it this way, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. You and I have to decide which one he is to us. He's either lying about being the God of the universe, he's a lunatic and is crazy and has no idea what it is that he's saying, or he is the Lord of all, and you have to decide if he's going to be your Lord. But all of us, when we sit down to the word of God, we have to make the choice. Am I just reading this because I want to check off the box? Or, I'm, or am I reading this like the couple on the road to Emmaus saying, Jesus, reveal yourself to me through your word. It says it this way in Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. This is God's story, plus your story, making history. Jesus is saying, I was there with the Father and the Son, and he said, let there be into the null of void, and then there was light. Jesus is saying, I'm there all the way at the end of time in history when you and I meet face to face, and the people of God are called to a massive reunion in heaven. I've been there every step of the way. It's all summed up in Jesus. That's our Christological hermeneutic. Reading life, reading our situations through the lens of God's love. Jesus, how are you revealing yourself to me in this difficult situation? Everything is his heart calling us back to himself. All of this can be seen through the scarlet thread of redemption. I didn't coin that phrase. It was actually coined by a pastor named W.A. Criswell. He was reading scripture and realized that just like the couple on the road to Emmaus, that all of scripture pointed to Jesus. He said it this way, we aren't examining scripture in light of world history. We're examining history in light of scripture. So the story of atonement and sacrifice begins and unfolds throughout the word of God until finally, in glory, we shall see great throngs of the saints who have been washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Listen, this sounds super weird outside of understanding the scarlet thread of redemption. Has anybody ever been in church? Remember when you first came to church and you're like, the blood? That's weird. And when we take communion, we're going to be taking communion. Why are we talking about blood and his body? And that's super weird. You know what? It's, it's going to sound weird unless we understand it in its context. And so even though I don't know what scriptures Jesus unpacked for that couple on the road to Emmaus, he had two hours, I have five minutes. But I just want to show you the scarlet thread starting from the beginning of time leading to where you're sitting right here and now. But how Jesus through all of it has said this story is about his story and your story making history. Let's start at the very beginning. Genesis 3, 21. The first man and the first woman and the first sin. They ate the forbidden fruit. They brought sin into creation. And you know what God does? It's the first recorded killing in all of Scripture. He kills some innocent animals to cover their nakedness with the fur 
of the animals so that they won't feel ashamed. First example, God's first response to our sin is that someone, something has to die to cover us from our sin. Now, fast forward to they have two kids, Cain and Abel. They bring offerings to God. Cain brought vegetables. God didn't like them. I hear you, God. I'm right there with you. Abel brought meat. God liked it. In fact, Abel brought an offering, fat portions, according to Genesis 4.4, 4, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, again, setting into motion this idea of the scarlet thread that something that dies on behalf of someone else is an acceptable offering to God. Fast forward to Genesis 22, verse 13. Abraham is told to sacrifice his son of promise, Isaac, on the altar. He's about to follow through with it because, as it says in Hebrews, he knows even if he has to kill his son, God will resurrect this promise. And just as he's about to do this, Abraham looked up, verse 13, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son, instead of you and I, he sacrificed his son for us. Again, the scarlet thread of redemption, a foreshadowing of what Jesus would be for you and I, taking our place. Fast forwarding now to Exodus chapter 12. The people of God are being going to be led out of Egypt, out of their slavery. And the final plague to come across all of Egypt is the plague of death on the firstborn child. The only way to make sure that when that angel of death comes over that your firstborn child doesn't die is to sacrifice an innocent lamb without blemish or spot and to wipe the blood of it on the doorpost which would have formed a cross, a cross of blood. And when that angel of death flew over and it saw a cross over your house, there would be no death in that house. The scarlet thread of redemption showing us that the reason why you and I are free in our homes, we can have confidence that they will come to know Christ and that we are preserved from sin, death, and hell is because of the blood of an innocent lamb that marks us all. Leviticus 16, now let's just go in and admit when we're picking and choosing which books we're gonna read. You know who you are. We all skip Leviticus. It's gross. It's disgusting. I don't wanna hear about your, your mold spores. I don't wanna be, hear about your skin diseases. Every time I read through Leviticus, I just thank God that I was not a priest back then. Boy, those guys, they had to look at everything. They had to deal with everything. I'm so, so very glad I get to be a pastor now and not back then. But that's the point. God's blood covers it all. He brings healing to everything. And this is about the sin offering. Leviticus 16, verse 21. The priest is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. And he shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of of a man appointed for the task. And the goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Again, a foreshadowing of that moment when Jesus took all of the sin of all humanity upon himself, and he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was the only time in all of his existence he was sent out to a solitary place and could not feel the presence of his Father, temporarily separated, so you and I could be eternally connected. Again, the scarlet thread of redemption leading all the way through Scripture until finally when he shows up on the scene in John chapter 1 and John the Baptist spies Jesus coming over the hill and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All the way from then to now. When we understand the context of these things, what it meant to Israel, what it meant to those people, all of a sudden you and I in the 21st century Christian we begin to understand the depth of God's love that this entire thing points to Jesus and how much he loves you. And how he took our place on the cross for as Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It begins to make a lot more sense why we celebrate communion. In fact, that's what we're going to do right now. I'd like to invite the worship team to come up, and I want to close with this quote from Renario Cantalamesa. 
who said if the written word of the Bible could be changed into a spoken word and become one single voice, this voice more powerful than the roaring of the sea would cry out, the Father loves you. The Father loves you. Do you believe that? Like when you hear those words, do they ring true? If not, he wants you to rediscover him this morning before we take communion. Everything that God does and says in the Bible, even God's anger is nothing but love. God is love. He's love in the Old Testament. He's love in the New Testament. This is his love letter to call you back to himself. Will you let yourself enter into a deeper relationship with him? I want to invite you back to that place where you know it. And, and, and in the notes, there's, there's some things that we, weren't, we were going to go over. But uh, when I woke up this morning, I felt like the Lord is saying he wanted to spend time with you through communion. This is not originally how we planned it for today. But right under your seat are, is the communion cup. That includes the, the wafer and the juice. And we're going to take this together. There's this beautiful place where as we just looked at the scarlet thread of redemption, when we read of Jesus sitting down at the Passover, it begins to make a whole lot more sense. Then he took a cup of wine, Luke chapter 22, verse 17, and when he had given thanks for it, he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom has come. And he took a loaf of bread and he thanked God for it and he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we just thank you that as we take this bread, we are just again in this moment reminded of the amazing love that reaches through the ages to meet us right here, right in this room, right in the middle of the places where we feel distant from you. And you meet us, God, to call us back to yourself. You meet us, God, to remind us that you make us whole and holy through your sacrifice, through your body broken, we can be made whole. This includes physical healing. If you're here right now and you need to be healed, you need a physical healing either for yourself or someone that you know, would you just raise your hand right now so we can agree with you in prayer? If you need a physical healing or someone that you know needs one, raise your hand. Yeah, I see those prayers right now. I'm raising my hand for my folks. Jesus, we just thank you, God, that this body, God, that was broken for us, by your bruises, we are healed. And God, even as we receive that healing for ourselves, God, we also pray, God, that on behalf of others that aren't here right now, we thank you, God, for that physical healing, for that spiritual healing, for that emotional healing, for that mental healing. This is something that we cannot possibly provide for ourselves, but you absolutely do. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, let's partake. Thank you for your body broken for us. And after supper, he took another cup of wine. He said, this wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you. An agreement sealed with the blood I will pour out for you. In light of the scripture that we just read and how you revealed yourself to that couple on the road to Emmaus, we sense you revealing yourself in a new way to us this morning. Even those of us who've known scripture and been in church for a long time, we sense you calling us back to yourself and back to your word. God, to a place of intimacy with you, not letting anything keep us from you. And by your blood, we are made clean. God, we are a covenant people. And this morning, God, we consecrate ourselves to you. And that starts with repentance. That starts with understanding that there's a place in us, God, where we have been distant from you. And we need to repent for the sins that we have been participating in so that we can receive cleansing that comes through confession. So just take a moment right now. If there's any place where you need to repent of your sins, thoughts, actions, attitudes, take a moment right now and repent of those. Repentance isn't just feeling sorry for it. You're confessing your sins to the Lord. 
asking God that God would change your heart and change your thinking about that sin. just receive your forgiveness because of your blood poured out you took all of our sin upon yourself and it no longer has a hold on us we are now no longer defined by our sin but by your righteousness and we receive that forgiveness in your name amen let's take this together thank you Jesus your blood poured out for us. Thank you for meeting us in this place. Thank you for calling us back to yourself and thank you for the gift of your word that is a daily invitation to a conversation with our creator. The scarlet thread of redemption means, God, that no matter what else we try, you are the only one that can satisfy. So as we stand right now, God, we use this closing song God, to show that our hearts belong to you. Let's stand together.